Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well and enjoying the week, not having to be in class. I want to talk today about packaging. I talked on uh, Thursday about the history of packaging, and we had left off right here to t where we're going to start talking about advances in, uh, advances in material technology. We talked about how we changed from going from carcasses down to even individual retail cuts. That through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Those changes would never have occurred if we hadn't understood more about how to do multi-layer lamination and co-extrusion of plastics that could be used as packaging material and how to really engineer and create those materials to meet the needs of individual products. And so that really changed the avenue. Instead of just calling up and there's only one type of product, one bag, I have some bags up here, I grabbed some bags from over at Rosenthal, but instead of everybody using the same bag, you could design the bag based on its properties to fit the product. If you had a product with a low pH, like barbecue sauce, you'd need more sealant. And the plastics they use for sealants, then you could engineer that. Also, that created so many avenues for product development people, and we got above average growth in the flexible packaging, and it, it is a really fun area to work on because as they learn more about polymer science and use of plastics in products, more will have. And hopefully on the field trip, Mr. David Grahams will be able to meet us who's been working for Cryovac since the uh, early 90s, mid 90s, and talk to us about some of the work that he does as a meat scientist with packaging materials. Well, I mentioned two words, co-extrusion and lamination. Before I get into these in a little bit more detail, I'd like to encourage you that if you ever have an opportunity to go to a packaging production facility, please do that. I think this year when we go to IPPE in February, that we may have a chance to go to one of the cryovac facilities to really see how plastics are made. On the field trip, we used to go to Oscar Mayer in Denton. Uh, it's no longer an Oscar Mayer plant, uh, but what was interesting about that plant is that they, they extruded, they co-extruded their packaging material online with, for their hot dogs and their other products. So when you walked in into their packaging room, you would see this like a, looked like a waterfall, but it was of plastics, and there were liquid plastics that then went into a cooling unit and rolled right out onto the roll stop machine, and they packaged hot dogs right there. That's something I'd never seen before. That gave them the flexibility of changing their product online, making their own products and not having to worry about ordering and quality, and take the responsibility for it. So on the slide here, I have uh, a couple of different systems, and I wanna talk about what is the difference between co-extrusion and lamination. First of all, the one common feature between these two systems is that both of them allow us the ability to put multiple layers of plastics into one. So when you look at this plastic bag that I have here, and I'm just gonna go ahead and take it off because otherwise I'm gonna, I wanna use it. There's more than three layers in this bag. I think that there's about seven. But you don't know that. It just looks like a plastic bag. You'd notice that it's thicker than the plastic bags you get at the grocery store. And this bag isn't really that thick. We have films that will be uh, anywhere from eight millimeters thick. You can get them up to 11 millimeters for very special products. Uh, this film right here, I think it's about three millimeters thick. 
And what the reason for the differences in thickness could be to multiple layers or could be due to thickness of individual layers that are put together. So co-extrusion and lamination are ways that we can layer multiple plastics in for different functionality. And I'm gonna come over here to the board and I'm just gonna explain a little bit about co-extrusion and lamination. David's running the camera and we, I'm gonna to try to make sure we capture the board here. So first, let's me, let me talk about co-extrusion. And in both of these systems, they purchase, usually I'm in uh, train car loads, and you probably don't realize it, we see lots of trains go through the AM campus. There are probably some of those train cars that have little, usually there are triangles or pellets of plastic that uh, have been produced at a manufacturing facility. And what was always neat about that Oscar Mayer plant is that you could see these combos or big containers of plastic material and you could walk up to them and you could pull out the pellets. They looked about the same, but there were different compounds in these and the different plastics that they would use. So both systems do the same thing. They use um, different products that they're going to melt and put together in layers. So in co-extrusion, co-extrusion is where the product's gonna come out all together. So there's gonna be a heat exchange unit here. And you're gonna bring up product from here product from here, usually using a vacuum of some type, and a, a hose, and it goes into individual chambers here that heat and melt the plastic so it's liquid. It's very hot. Then it's going to go through a pressure uh, some type of system and it's going to allow the liquid to drop in layers and the amount of pressure and the size of the opening determines the thickness of the plastic. So at this point in time, you still have three, because I have three, there might be five, eight of these containers with different formulations. We're gonna keep this simple so that you get an idea of, of how this is done. Uh, but you can change the thickness of an individual layer. You can change the kind of products are in, in the individual layer by changing out products that you order in these big combos. And then the product is uh, released. And you'll see in the picture where you have that very large sheet that looks like it just kind of came out of nowhere. Isn't that interesting? Look at this first picture. See this sheet of plastic that's just coming down? Up here is the pressure and the, the heat exchanger. And so when this comes, this material comes out, it definitely has a layering, but it's then going to be cooled and stretched uh, to get the polymers uh, to crystallize and to uh, provide their final structure. Polymer science is a whole science and a major if, if you wanted to be go that far. So I'm keeping this very simple. And you end up here with a sheet that if we look at on this head on, it just looks like a thin piece piece of plastic. On co-extrusion, uh, they may all they may also stretch or provide some some force to the product. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm illustrating making a, uh, a single layer. They can also extrude this so that there are two layers, like in a tube, and then they blow that tube up into a big bubble. I'll never forget the first time I saw that, I went to a cryovac plant uh, outside of Greenville and looked up, and it looked like a big balloon. And then they brought it back down 
and they're reducing that as a way to stretch the plastic to get it to adhere. They do that while it is still very warm because it shrink, they shrink it back down. And that's part of the whole functionality of getting those plastics in there to bond together. The nice thing about co-extrusion, because it's extruded when it's still liquid and then use pressure to bring it back together, there's a tighter bond Between, between the layers. If you would take this plastic bag, this is just a rolled plastic bag from Rosenthal. It's a regular beef barrier bag used for subprimals. And if you took this bag and put it in the, uh, the little hot, the, the knife dipping, area. Notice I've done this. It's what you do again late at night in the plant when you're waiting for the ovens to get done. And then take it and go like this. The layers will separate. This is made by lamination. Co-extrusion has tighter layers. Co-extrusion takes a little bit more to do. And so the cheaper way of making a plastic, a little bit cheaper way, is lamination. And so lamination, uh, in lamination it's very similar. You may use the same plastics, but in this case, you individually heat and pressurize, uh, pressurize heat, pressure, heat, pressure, heat, pressure. So you bring this product, this product, if I can get this, over here, and you extrude a sheet of plastic. Then you bring these together with but not to the point of being liquid, but melting it partially and pressure. And basically sandwich the layers together. You can also do things like stretch this or um, you can make bags or you can make tickle stock, roll stock film like what you see in this picture, when I talk about roll stock film, I'm talking about big round, uh, uh, just big round rolls of, of film, where this is a bag, and usually bags are in boxes and they come out and they're either taped or you pull them apart. So you can make a roll stock, a bag, anything out of co-extrusion or laminated products. But there is a difference in cost. The uh, lamination usually is used in a little bit thinner products and co-extrusion is used for higher quality products. Not always, but sometimes. So we can then, you can see that with co-extrusion or lamination, we have a lot of options in packaging we can change the different layers depending on the functionality of the layers. So, what are we gonna to try to do with this product and this package? What are the important characteristics? Well, in meat, our most important characteristic is not only to provide protection of foods against harmful environmental factors. If we have a piece of meat out here, that's open to the environment. It's obviously open to cross-contamination, to uh, anything that's aerosol. In this room, if I walk by, had a piece of meat, sneeze on it, obviously, there's gonna be a lot of microorganisms that will end up on that product. But if we place it in a bag, we protect it from the environment. And that's one of the biggest and most important functions of packaging. 
And why do we package product? We package it to protect it. Whether it's a, an album, uh, a CD, a uh, piece of candy, or a package of meat. And to understand how to build the package that's going to be the best, what we do there is look at what is needed in that product to protect it and then build the package from there. In food products, we look at physical, biochemical, and microbial uh, hazards. I think you probably heard that from HACCP. And we have to decide which one of these three mechanisms, physical, biochemical, or microbial, are going to terminate the shelf life of a product before other mechanisms become a concern. Well, one of the, one of the things that's the greatest uh, limitation of shelf life is microbial growth. A lot of you are doing uh, microbial growth, just aerobic plate counts. Dr. Taylor talked to you on Thursday about microorganisms, and they are the, the thing that microbial growth usually in fresh meat limits shelf life. It's what causes meat to go bad. So of these three, if we're talking about fresh meat, frozen meat we'll talk about in a minute, we're going to be concerned about microbial hazards and microbial growth. And so what can we do in this packaging material so to, to set specifications that will minimize microbial growth? In frozen meat, we have a, a biochemical reaction that limits shelf life because lipid oxidation is the main limiting factor to shelf life for frozen product because microorganisms can't grow. And so when we have packages for frozen meat versus fresh meat, we build those packages a little bit different as far as what plastics we use, what thickness we use, and, and, and what we need in the product. So keeping that in mind, what are the properties we want to build into packaging materials? We want to sit back as we think about this frozen and fresh meat package. We want to think about what are the transport properties? What is the product shelf life that we want? What cost do we want to, uh, to what cost range we want to be at? Um, what is the packaging system abuse resistance that, that is needed? And then there might be some other characteristics that are product dependent. So as a packaging engineer, they would sit back and say, okay, here's a fresh meat, meat, and here's frozen meat. And they would go through this list to look at what they really need to have in the product. But both of those products are most likely going to go into boxes, into cardboard boxes, be placed on pallets. The pallets be placed in storage, moved by, uh, by I just went blank on, uh, on forklifts. <laughs> there we go, forklifts. And then put into storage and then removed from storage into another storage facility and transported on a truck. Pallets are usually wrapped with plastic to try to stabilize them so that they don't move a lot. So these products, well, they're gonna have to have some transport properties the transport properties are going to be very similar to the environment that they're stored in. The product shelf life for most fresh meat and vacuum packaged subprimals, we want, uh, we'd ideally like about 40 days shelf life. Uh, we, we're getting up to 40. We've had products go over 90 days in shelf life. Very nice not to have microbial growth, but then some other things start taking over. Frozen product, you would like six months to 12 months of shelf life. Cost, in the meat industry, everything is always lowest cost. In a fresh product, you want your uh, packaging material probably to be two to three cents a bag. It's gone up to about, I'm sure a little bit higher than that now. For value added products, and here I have a, what is this? Introducing the new Easy Open, 
bag and they were using these at IPPE uh, last year and they were packaging hams in them. They were fake hams, just so you know, but it, it was fun to watch. So this bag, if you felt this bag, it feels different than this bag. This one also has an easy open tab, okay? And so the cost of this bag, which is printed on, is much higher than the cost of this bag. And so you try to build what, what are the most important needs into the product. Packaging system abuse resistance. What is that? That's uh, what kind of abuse will the product take just that's inherent in the product. One of the things with frozen product is if it's bone in, you want a different packaging material than if it's boneless. The reason for that is uh, you take a T-bone steak, you freeze it usually in some kind of mechanical freezer or CO2 liquid nitrogen so that it freezes right away. It's uh, placed in the package material when it goes through freezing. So uh, those freezing systems are usually at about 100 negative 100 degrees C. It's pretty cold. Package material needs to not crack and break. We also used to have, we had a problem uh, when I was in industry where we had a bunch of T-bones come back because the vacuum package broke on them. We found out that the packaging people got, there was the end of the shift and they were tired and they, uh, they had been running boneless product all day. They came and got the T-bones that they needed to finish up the shift and they just put them in the same material. And uh, the T-bones, not only do they freeze in a spiral, but in this plant, they came out the top and they went down a slide, kind of like being at Slitterbond. And uh, this was a stainless steel slide and they hit the bottom where there was a uh, Lazy Susan type round uh, container stainless steel that went like this. So they got to ride down the slide and hit the bottom and go around and then they were packaged and pull, people pulled those off and packaged in the box. The fresh product not only was weakened by having to go through the freeze cycle because it was never meant to do that, but then you have a bone-in product that has that's very hard and the T-bone is a pretty tough little character and when you hit a t-bone uh, on the side of a stainless steel uh, slide and conveyor system it tends to poke holes so we had pinholes and we had product just basically cracking on us because they used the wrong packaging material they didn't go get the frozen film we talked about we always had frozen film fresh film and then we had film with other names as well. So how much abuse resistance is needed and what system it's going to go through. And then there might be some other product specific ones. I put a couple of different products here because this is a smoked product with a lot of pepper and seasoning on the outside. And these are just fresh pork chops. Uh, obviously this pepper and this surface is going to be a lot rougher. And so when you pull a Put the film in this case they're pulling film over the top and vacuum packaging it making it look like tray over wrap uh, there's going to be some more abuse resistance with that pepper uh, versus something like this which is just a plain pork chop so you have to take in all those considerations uh, it took me a while to convince my uh, partners when i was at monford that we couldn't use the same film for our shredded beef with barbecue sauce that we use for our pre-cooked tenderloin, our eye round steaks. Because uh, the low pH caused, uh, was actually had a, resulted in more, uh, some interaction with abuse resistance and we lost a lot of seals. So uh, you, you look at those things, properties of the packaging material. So in meat products, we almost always talk about the barrier properties. We build our product because we're trying to reduce microbial growth or reduce lipid oxidation in frozen product. And so we want a property that will give us 
resistance to our permeant. And in our case, for both systems, our permeant, or the thing that causes spoilage, is oxygen. And uh, that relates to its barrier properties. How can this package be designed so that the middle layer in here uh, provides barrier to oxygen moving through. And we'll a lot of times talk about classifications of barrier. So for example, when I was in industry and the Cryback guys or the Kerwood guys or American Can guys came by to sell me film for a new product or I wanted to talk to them about a product, they would say, do you want a low, medium, or a high barrier? What they were talking about was, in this product, do you want to, a low barrier means, in general, these are general numbers, uh, a less than, or I'm sorry, greater than 300 cc's uh, per mil of meter squared of oxygen that can run through that package at 90% relative humidity at 23 degrees C. What does that mean? What that means is that with a low barrier, oxygen can move across that barrier very easily. Because in frozen product, we may not need as much barrier. If, I, if they didn't have anything on the shelf, that they already had for other people or kind of stock product uh, that they considered low barrier, then I would start looking at what they had and maybe specifying the barrier. The barrier is always directly related to cost. The more barrier, the more expensive. So a medium barrier film is going to allow less oxygen to move across the barrier high barrier will is even lower 50 to 100 cc's where ultra high is less than 10. and barrier is measured by that permeability to oxygen so what you do and i'm going to go over here again give david a chance to move this over while i raise the board and we, I've actually had a chance to work with a packaging engineer that we had in chemistry for a while, and it was really fun because he do, did all the polymer chemistry and I got to just eat the products and measure things and how they change. So how you measure barrier or permeability is you take an enclosed, usually glass, we use high-tech glass called mason jars. And you put a, you have a, like a bracket that holds your packaging material in the middle to form two chambers. And on one side, you create an oxygen uh, change in equilibrium. So you store this and up here at you start at a standard temperature and humidity and i talked up here about 90 percent relative humidity at 23 degrees c so we set up a chamber in the back sensory lab where we could monitor the relative humidity at a standard amount and the temperature, they actually brought it over. And then they put in here a standard amount of their permit. In this case, it was oxygen. And they measured, and this chamber over here had no oxygen. And with a standard amount of time, they they did the area of the plastic that was exposed, and they also measured the thickness of the plastic, usually in milliliters, millimeters. And so at a standard time, in this case, 
24 hours. That's pretty standard for oxygen barrier type properties. You measure how much oxygen, the change in oxygen level. How much oxygen is going to move through that standard size, thickness, at uh, standard time, temperature, and relative humidity. And that uh, gives us permeability. And notice here, I've given you an equation for permeability. Permeability equals thickness by transmission rate. So thickness is the thickness of the film. Transmission rate at these standard conditions are how much oxygen gets transferred over. So that, you can test different films to establish this kind of a simplified version, uh, the permeability. Some of you in your proposals talked about packaging material and I asked you to give its transmission rate, okay? So this is very important. Low, medium, high, ultra high. There are a lot of times that my salespeople would say, you know, as we're talking about the product, well, what do you want the shelf life to be? Every salesman in the world wants it to be more than what's realistic. That's just a fact of life. So, you know, we're doing it. Like, I'll use the shredded uh, beef with barbecue sauce. I'm like, well, what do we want the shelf life to be? How long? And in, uh, in the retail package, do we want this product to be able to stay? You know, uh, 30 days. Ah, uh, that's a lot. So, I would start working with that, and I'm like, okay. You want 30 days? This is what it's going to cost per package. Oh, well, we can't have that. All right. Well, how about how about 21 days? Could could we go with 21 days shelf life and use this packaging material a, with a high barrier that is has a reduced cost? Now, I'm going to tell you a secret. I always had if that's the case, I'd always have 30 days and I'd only tell them 21 because that was our guarantee. So, and we had the same boss, so you just let your boss know, right? That's the way you keep your job. So, think about those things. What factors affect the permeation through the film? What factors are gonna change oxygen's ability to go from a chamber with high pressure uh, high concentration, high mill equivalent, and move through what we think of as a fairly solid, flexible package to be over in this chamber. How do we change that? What can we do to that plastic? And some of the things, the way that you read this chart is that if you have a low permeate permeate solubility in the polymer, it's going to decrease permeation. So if we want to decrease oxygen's ability to move from high and keep it from moving over to the chamber. In other words, we know we have about 16% oxygen out in the environment, right? And when we vacuum package a product, there's less than 1% oxygen in that package. So we have created very similar situation to what we have up here on the board with oxygen in those two chambers. Oxygen wants in, right? It wants to go to equilibrium. So it's pounding at that plastic to try to get in. And they're, depending on the, the, the permeation characteristics, the things that will decrease its ability to move uh, through that, in this case, oxygen, is if the permeant is soluble in the polymer, it's, it can move. 
You don't even think about that, but oxygen actually, it, if it has a high affinity, if it's soluble in the polymer, it's going to be able to move through it. So we build and use plastics that we know have a low solubility of oxygen in those materials so that we can decrease the oxygen transmission or permeation. The pressure of the permeant, if it's low, it's going to be able to move more rapidly. I mean, it's, if the pressure is low, it's going to move more rapidly. If it's high, it's going to increase. What does that mean? We have uh, oh, two very distinct different packaging systems, modified atmosphere packaging and vacuum packaging. In vacuum packaging, we remove most of the air. We leave a little bit less than 1% depending on the product. So we have in vacuum packaging, I'm going to try to write up on the board. Uh-oh, that didn't work. Let me go back. I'm going to have to use this board or let me try a different pen. Okay. Uh, no, not going to work. In vacuum packaging, and I like to put these both up here so that it can be apparent. Don't forget this picture I drew up here. But I want to vacuum packaging versus modified atmosphere packaging. Okay. So think of out here in the environment we have about 16% oxygen. That's the permeant we're worried about. In vacuum packaging we're going to have less than 1% oxygen inside the package. So you can see here that oxygen is going to want to move from the outside in. Our most common atmosphere that we put in modified atmosphere packaging, that's where we take and we pull a vacuum, evacuate the product, and then insert a gas of known mixture back in so the product looks blown up and like it has an atmosphere, but we've controlled what that atmosphere is. Most often we use 80% oxygen and 20% CO2. In this case, in modified atmosphere packaging, we have a hot, a really high partial pressure of oxygen here, don't we? Because there's 80% oxygen here and 16 on the outside. I mean, we have it pretty much here in the vacuum package too, but it's not as great a difference. 16 minus 1 is 15. 16, uh, 80 minus 16 is 64. The difference. So in modified atmosphere packaging, we're going to have to build an oxygen barrier that's more, uh, more, where we, let me go back here, where the, uh, because we in, inherently have a high pressure of the permeant inside. Part of the reason we put 80% oxygen is that through the shelf life, we're hoping to leave the least 40% by the end of the shelf life because some oxygen is going to move out. It's going to try to go to, to equilibrium. If we increase film thickness, we're going to decrease permeation of oxygen. The thinner the film is, the, uh, the more uh, easily oxygen is going to permeate through. We can also change the plastics. Remember those little plastic chips I talked about? You order those from the company. And what you do is all of these have a polymer, a plastic polymer, or maybe more than one polymer, and then they also have filler. They're not 100% pure. They have some carrier compounds. The, uh, the higher the density of the polymer, the more expensive, but if you have the polymer that's going to, you have more polymer, and polymers cross, cause cross links. If you think about a polymer, if we're going to magnify 
this piece of package material here, and we magnify it, we would see it's a structure of polymers of some type, probably not quite this organized, but something like that. And so if we create, if we use more polymers, then what we're going to do is we're going to add more crosslink, more, right, more density. The polymer is going to be there instead of the filler that doesn't really provide any resistance. We can also change the crosslinking of the polymer. Part of what we're doing when we do this pressurization, the heat and the pressurization, and how we extrude the film out, and then how we might stretch the film and bring it back changes the cross-linking. So this might be what we have initially, but by heating and applying more pressure, we start seeing that some of these polymer units that are out here that may not be totally bound together, they crystallize or they cross-link more. So then they become more a part of the matrix. So what it's doing is it's helping us to build the matrix instead of having some loose ends out there. We can also change the crystallinity of the polymer, and uh, usually that is with also with heat and pressure. So if we use more heat, well, we melt it, and then we use more pressure, uh, what we'll do is with some of these spokes here, we're gonna change their structure so that they have a, a difference in crystallinity. So I drew all of mine to kind of these straight lines, but wonder if we applied more pressure and we had uh, some lines in here that were like that. See how that would start to limit some of the movement of oxygen through these holes? Think how little oxygen is. It's a little dirty guy, right? And it's bouncing up against here and it's trying to move through. We can change the amount of plasticizers and fillers if they are low plasticizers and fillers. So again, kind of the same thing as the density of the polymer. We have a higher percentage of polymer. So very low fillers of plasticizers because a, a filler or a plasticizer is, is gonna be in this matrix, but it's not gonna be as strong. So we increase, decrease the amount of those. We're gonna have a low, or we're gonna decrease the permeation of oxygen through the film. If we have more of that because we want a cheaper film, uh, then we're gonna have more oxygen able to permeate. Affinity to water. If, if the uh, final film has a low affinity to water, it's going to have uh, less permeation of oxygen through the film if it has a high affinity because oxygen is water soluble and if it has affinity for water it means there's some solubility in there and water can move through. So those are the things that they talk about on a practical basis. Uh, so when I talked to the cryovac guys I said hmm I need a greater oxygen barrier in my shredded beef with barbecue sauce because they decided they want to uh, 30 day shelf life. The first thing they always do is increase the thickness. And the reason for that is that that's just a little change in the extrusion process. Allow more, a little bit wider space on the extrusion head and you get a thicker barrier film. That's the easiest. Always costs money, but it's the easiest. To change cross-linking or crystallinity. Uh, you can change temperature as well. Uh, then those things are really things that you change with pressure and stretching. When you look at permeate solubility in the polymer and uh, density of the polymer and plasticizers and fillers, those affect what you get in the tubs and you're going to a higher pure polymer that costs more money. So the first thing they're gonna do is try to just change the thickness. The next thing they'll do is either 
change the temperature or the pressure to see if they can get more barrier properties. So that's what they do. And all this costs more money. It's all, a lot nicer to do this uh, when you have um, something off the shelf that will work. So in these layers, we usually talk about at least three layers, and there can be more layers than this, but I wanna talk in general that when we're building a package, we always talk about the outer layer, the middle layer, and the inner layer. The outermost layer is what's gonna provide abuse resistance. We had a different outer layer on the frozen T-bone film than on the fresh T-bone film, and that's why when it hit the, the stainless steel at the end of its little uh, run down uh, the, the, the chute there, uh, it broke when we used the fresh film. So what we needed was actually, we needed more nylon. And so we have, uh, you have to consider the temperature and you build that with poly uh, amides like nylon or polyesters. One of the funny things that happened as far as packaging material when I arrived at Monford was I went to the cook room and I was pretty green. I was fresh out of a PhD program. And I spent my first year after my PhD teaching horseback riding. So uh, I walked in and they showed me what they were doing in the cook-in room. Oh, this is really fun. They had some corned beef brisket, tasted pretty good. They were putting the corned beef brisket raw in this bag. Then they loaded it into the oven and they cooked it. And when they got done cooking it, all the bags, the, both the seals were melted and the bag was shriveled up. And I had heard that there were things called cook-in bags, bags where you could cook product. This is a cook-in bag. And so Cryovac came by, Cryovac salesman, I could still tell you his name. Uh, and, and I'm like, I need some cooking bags. He's like, how many? I said, send me a box. And we got the cooking bags. I put the, uh, and he said, you want adhesion or no adhesion? I said, no adhesion. Because I'm going to pull these out of the bag probably. At least at first. I'll need, if I want the adhesion, I'll, I'll get it later. He said, I'll send you a box of both. Took the, the cook-in bag material, sealed it, vacuum sealed it, uh, put the product in the oven, and when we finished the cook cycle, opened the oven, and all the bags were intact. And you know what? Our cook yield was much higher than what it was. Saved them a lot of money just by using the right bag. So uh, the cook-in uh, bag has a, usually polypropylene, is used to give it that protection against temperature and heat. So you kind of have to know a little bit and use your, uh, the companies and your colleagues. Even as a scientist, I call Cryovac up. I have uh, four of my former graduate students who work there and I call them up and I say, what's going on here? Uh, what, what are my options? What are people using? The middle layer is what provides uh, the barrier to gas permeation. And as you know, that barrier is an oxygen barrier for us. Uh, the uh, compounds used most commonly are, are polyvinyl, vinyl being chloride, PVDC, and ethylene vinyl alcohol. I can tell you that in industry, they use all of these, they use uh, the letters. I remember the first time I'm like, I need to increase the shelf life. Oh, so you want some more EVOH in the middle layer? Sure. No idea what they were talking about. Uh, that was before the internet, and so I had to go to the library and look it up and uh, found out what it was. But um, these compounds are the optional compounds to give more, uh, more barrier, higher barrier characteristics. The inner layer is what's going to provide the humectant seal. Because what we do when we're either doing modified atmosphere packaging or vacuum packaging is the, the product is placed in the bag. The bag goes through a chamber, or if it's 
in a roll stock film like like this. Uh, it's placed. Uh, this the bottom uh, stock may have been formed into a pocket, heated, pulled with a vacuum into a shape, and then the product is placed in it, or the product's placed in here. The next step is always to uh, either as to pull a vacuum. It usually blows it up and then in a bag and then pulls all the air out that it can. And then the heat, the seal is uh, a heat bar and then it uses heat and pressure. That's why you have a pressure bar as well, forms a seal. And that's what the inner seal is. Uh, if you're doing roll stock, the top film comes over and it is uh, sealed uh, to depending on whether it's a forming, top forming, or bottom forming film. We're gonna see all these options when we go out on the field trip, or you can go over to Rosenthal. So the hermetic seal, the types of uh, materials used for that are polyethylenes, ethylene vinyl acetate, EVA, or ionomers. So you can see that we build this package by buying uh, these different compounds in those combo bins that are then pulled up. So hopefully that ties all of that together. Packaging can come as bags. I have some bags here, right? Lots of bags. Laminates, casings. And I tried to show some, some variability here in the pictures I put up. Uh, this is obviously a bag with a subprimal, it's a plate being put in there. Uh, these are bags on inside rounds. This is a bag around a ribeye roll. And so those are very commonly used. We can use laminates, that's what is used here. This is actually Excel's first case ready program. And what they did is they used a blue film and they formed a pocket. Uh, and then they place the meat in the pocket and then they put a film over the top that uh, sealed around the product. Those are laminates and that starts out as that big roll stock. Uh, it looks like a big uh, wrapping paper roll, but it's clear. This machine right here shows how we use casings. And so this is a ground beef machine. The casing, uh, I think it's right there. Yeah, right there. And of course it is, um, I use this for my roll stock, but it's really casing. So it looks like this, it's in a roll. It comes out, they blow it up. And then in this case, they have a V-mag with a stuffer that stuffs the product in. They clip it on the end, they stuff it all the way up, and then they clip it again. This, you buy ground beef, pork sausage, and these type of cases. And uh, you can build this product to be aerobic or anaerobic, depending on how much barrier you put in it and how much shelf life you want and what you want the cost to be. Uh, and so the, we've already talked about this. There's also rigidity options. There's flexible. All of these that I have up here are considered flexible packaging, right? Very flexible. But we also can have semi-rigid. This is a modified atmosphere package ground beef product. This is a semi-rigid tray. Rigid is like a plastic tray that you might um, get. Uh, I always buy the turkey, cranberry, walnut salad at HEB, and that's, a, that's a considered a rigid tray, where this product here would be called semi-rigid. And then we also have aseptic packing. So depending on what the characteristics are that you want in the plastic, like we talked about in the previous slides, you can take that and you can build it into whatever form that you want it to be in. So what do we use in our, the meat industry? There's a very simple styrofoam tray with PVC overwrap right here. I think all of you are aware of that. Styrofoam trays are cheap. This uh, overwrap has no oxygen barrier in it. So that is basically the same environment inside that package as it is out in the air. 
It has very limited shelf life. Um, it is uh, very traditional. Consumers are used to purchasing product that way. And the product has very good color because it's ox fully oxygenated. The biggest disadvantage is it has a very short shelf life. And you really shouldn't freeze in this product because there's the moisture barrier while it's there, it's not going to really uh, protect the product like it needs to be during freezing. Some alternatives to the styrofoam tray overwrap is to use a styrofoam tray and do what's called a skin pack. And this is um, some salmon that's been skin packed. And what sometimes they use a different styrofoam tray, sometimes they use the same styrofoam tray and do a, a layer underneath and a layer on top. Uh, here's a steak that's also been skin packed. Uh, there's a, some other examples of product that have been skin packed. A lot of work in that area. Uh, vacuum package though is what's going to give us the longest shelf life and it's going to use films that have a higher barrier property especially for product that is not frozen. And we can see here the traditional vacuum package. This has to be some pork chops. Uh, usually it is a clear film. You can print on it. You can add labels to it if you want to. And I, you, I know that you've seen lots of product like that. The advantages of vacuum package, and here's some product that's vacuum package. Here's a bone-in product with a bone barrier in the bag. It has a very long shelf life. It can freeze easily in the vacuum package and it's very good with value added products, but it does give the product a darker color. We're going to talk about the different states of myoglobin and when we're in an oxygen deprived environment below 16%, the product turns into reduced myoglobin, which is more purple and it's unfamiliar to consumers. And it also compresses the product because it applies some pressure. The nice thing is, is it gets us very, it, it decreases the amount of purge, free water in a product. It's always good. And it works well with ground beef, sausage, ground turkey, those type of products, as well as subprimates. Uh, consumers are getting more used to seeing this product because they're, uh, used to be you never saw vacuum package subprimals in a retail case. But I, by my pork, all of it is vacuum packaged because I don't buy chops that are PVC overwrapped. I buy loins, tenderloins, uh, shoulder roast, uh, which they sell as carnitas at HEB, that type of thing. Here's how vacuum packaging works. Uh, so you place the product here. Uh, this is the seal bar that's going to heat. The lid comes down to create a vacuum environment. Uh, the product has air, so it blows up the bag, and then it sucks the air out. After it sucks the air out and in the vacuum and in the chamber, then these heat bars come down and they're heated, that's why it's red, and they apply pressure. So in different packages need more pressure. When you go to cook in product, you have to increase the amount of pressure and the length of time that the seal is applied in order to get a good seal that's not going to come apart. And so with each product and each package material, you may have some variation. And modified atmosphere packaging, which always continues to get uh, a lot of, of, of interest, it uses that most common is at 80% oxygen, 20% CO2. You can use other gases. You can, uh, carbon dioxide is used to limit microbial growth. And nitrogen is a cheap filler gas and oxygen is used to stabilize color. The advantage is, is that when you're using modified atmosphere packaging, which can be done in the same systems that use back, they use the vacuum package. You just have to, they, they all, you could take and have um, containers of gas and you could either have the gas pre-mixed for you or you can have multiple containers of gas where you adjust the pressure going in with valves and uh, to get the mixture you want. And it um, evacuates the product and then it inserts in a known that known gas. 
and notice that it doesn't compact the product. And because it has such a high oxygen content, well above the 16%, it gives us a bright, fresh color. The disadvantage is that it's very difficult to monitor. If you don't have perfect seals, you don't know it. Uh, you can have good seals, but not perfect seals that leak. And your modified atmosphere package uh, environment is going to leak out into the environment and go to standard environment levels if you're not careful and it's gonna limit your shelf life. Um, we also know that some uh, metabolism continues. If you put a high amount of oxygen into a product, mitochondria still have the ability to respire a little bit. And so they're gonna use up, they're gonna absorb some oxygen and produce some CO2. It's not huge, but it's a very subtle change. And that uses up some of the oxygen. Another reason to have high oxygen that's well above where you want it to be at 16%. And we also know that microorganisms, they are going to grow if they have oxygen available. And they found out that at 20% CO2, you can kind of still get some microbial growth retardation, keep the red color, and you can do that over time. So, it will increase shelf life a little bit compared to PVC. Uh, but remember, those leakers are hard to identify. And in large packages, modified atmosphere packaging takes up a lot more space because you always have to have some head space, right? And head space is the space in between the product and the package. And if you have a larger package, you're going to have more head space. You can also not put as much product per unit volume on a truck that's modified atmosphere package versus vacuum package because of that head space. It usually has twice the bulk of a normal product. And this is how modified atmosphere packaging works, very similar. You put, uh, this happens to be showing uh, a roll stock system where the film is heated and then it's uh, formed in a pocket. The product is placed in the pocket and then it goes into a chamber and this is gonna be the top film. And uh, there's the seal bar. So what happens is the, the, a vacuum is pulled and then a standard level of gas is inserted. And then the film that is placed there, then the seal bar goes down and seals it. That's how that works. There's lots of information in the literature about what is the combination. People played with lots of combinations. I'm not going to go through this slide. I want you to know that the most common combination today is the 80% oxygen, 20% CO2. And uh, nitrogen can be used in combination usually to replace the oxygen. Most people try to stay at 20% CO2 or higher. CO2 is pretty expensive gas though, and oxygen is very expensive. And uh, so they replace it with nitrogen to decrease the cost. Too much nitrogen will cause some browning, uh, some, uh, because the nitrogen binds to the ligand or the myoglobin. And it's used more for packaging processed meats where you have a standardized color set through curing or through processing. Carbon dioxide is used as uh, to inhibit growth of bacteria. It does have bacterial static effects. So it lengthens the lag phase of microbial growth. And it's very synergistic with low temperature to, to help uh, provide a little bit better effect. Uh, but if you get to too high of concentrations, it's gonna cause some discoloration. And most people agree that optimum level is at 15 to 20% for fresh meat. And oxygen is the one that really affects color. And uh, at, at, at hot, and if we have 16%, we're gonna inhibit anaerobic bacteria. We're just gonna get uh, aerobic bacteria growing. And um, here's two of the species. I'm not gonna talk about that much. Uh, but the, the biggest thing is that with a high level of oxygen at 16 or higher percent, we're gonna put our myoglobin in the oxymyoglobin state and it's gonna look better and uh, people think
think it's fresh. That's what consumers tell us. Um, so uh, there's been a, a lot, there are a lot of work done on carbon monoxide and in 2004 FDA approved the use of carbon monoxide. You may go, be going, are you sure that's what you want to say? And it is. Carbon monoxide is used at very low levels. Uh, there's a lot of concern that it would be used at a high enough level that if you had a problem with gas leakage or consumers were exposed to too much of it, that it would cause problems. Because carbon monoxide will bind to myoglobin and to hemoglobin um, has greater affinity to binding for it to it instead of oxygen. And that's why people suffocate and die if they uh, if they are exposed to an environment like uh, like gas fumes, like uh, motor fumes, right? That's high in carbon monoxide. But carbon carbon monoxide used at very low levels actually inhibits myoglobin formation which is the, the dark brown, it forms carbo carboxymyoglobin. It also helps to inhibit rancidity, and it has been being used. And we find that we get even a little bit brighter red color with a little bit of carbon monoxide compared to no carbon monoxide. So it, it is approved and it can be used. The key is that with modified atmosphere packaging, there's probably as many options as, as, as we could list and list and list and list. But you have to get the right combination of gases for the functionality and the shelf life desired, uh, the appropriate packaging equipment, and then uh, also the size and the proper volume per package. Do you notice that these products all have some headspace, but they don't put that in a bigger package to use more headspace, but this is the minimum size that has enough headspace to be effective. So uh, that's the end of packaging. And these are the main uh, items that I talked about in this lecture, understanding laminate versus co-extrusion, looking at the function of different layers of packaging materials, looking and understanding the different properties of film and how to impact shelf life. And I have asked you to understand how vacuum packaging, skin packaging, and modified atmosphere packaging works, and what gases are used to modify atmosphere packaging, what is their function, what approximate levels it used to be. So thank you very much.